So hello everyone. Uh, I'm Abdul Takim Rafi. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Biomedical Engineering at the University of British Columbia. I work uh, at the Tabor Lab here at UBC. And today I'm going to present uh, a recent work we did, detecting and avoiding homology-based uh, data leakage in genome train sequence model. So this was a nice collaboration with uh, Brett Kyoto from Yachi Lab, which is also at the School of Biomedical Engineering. I'll just try to, uh, just give me a moment. Yeah, you have to move your mouse to the other screen and then. Oh, oh thank you. I just got something to figure out. So before I start uh, today's presentation, I would like to give an outline. At the beginning, uh, I'll start with the background uh, where I try to set the premise for today's uh, presentation. Then I will address the problem we're discussing and the impact the problem will have uh, on many of the sequence modeling that, uh, that we're interested in. And probably uh, try to provide a solution to overcome this and then have a discussion. And in the talk, like, you know, if you have any questions, like, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, that'll be fine. So, Functions describe the world around us. And many of the real world functions that are uh, of interest to us uh, may be very complex uh, for us to model with just equations with all the parameters. We tend to use predictive models uh, to model, uh, approximate these complex functions. Uh, we use uh, these models to make accurate predictions and sometimes even understand to, uh, the underlying mechanism. So here I have a, uh, uh, compared with simpler uh, nonlinear sinusoidal function. Now, if we are training a predictive model on this, we'd be uh, probing the function by collecting data points. Now, if I train a linear regressor on this data set, uh, uh, it would not do a good job at predicting. Now, let's say I jump and I uh, just use a neural network. And if I do a, a decent job, it will start approximating the underlying. And if I do a really good job, uh, you'll see that, okay, it will start doing a very good job at approximating the function. Now, when uh, neural networks are always fitted to the gate data that are given, so a big part of uh, training neural network comes down to evaluating neural networks so that they are, are performing on data that has not been seen during training. Now, I'm giving a scenario where uh, I have the training data may have come from a certain region and the network is fitted and it works very well on the training data. But the network might fail, fail on the test case, which is uh, would be the ultimate use case for us. Now, in sequence modeling, when we are training neural networks that predict the function of DNA, we want to make sure that, okay, they would be applicable to personalized genomes uh, so that they account for uh, multiple genomic variations. So when we are training uh, any kind of model, like having a test data that uh, is very much needed and which we will use to understand the model's ability to generalize. And the test set should not have any leakage uh, with the training data. It must not be seen during the any phase of model development. Otherwise, uh, you will have like uh, some overestimation of your model's performance. Now, this is a uh, brings a substantial ch challenge in genomics because we know that okay, our genome contains sequences that are very much similar to sequences elsewhere in the genome. So how do we train and test a uh, model on genomic sequences? So I want to show this uh, figure. Uh, it is a word cloud made on uh, by taking 20, mar, uh, uh, 20 mars from chromosome one. And this is, uh, as you can see here, that uh, it is very much overrepresented over by certain 20 mars. So what would be the implication of this, like when we are training sequence to expression models on genomic sequences, because the models would uh, see certain sequences more than the other. 
And the problem is, uh, is so big because 50% of the genome contains repetitive elements. So there is a high chance that, okay, if you change on one sequence, uh, you may see the same sequence during testing. So here I'm showing um, two homologous sequences that are taken from uh, two different chromosomes, one of 16 and nine. And I'm showing the protein accessibility, um, which uh, I use, I'm using the ataxic uh, read count as a proxy for that. And as you can see here, these two sequences, thousand days per long, they're very similar to each other. And they share almost an identical uh, accessibility track. Now, if I did a chromosomal splitting to train a tester model, there's a chance that I could be training on sequence from chromosome 16, and I could be testing with the other sequence. And uh, so it would be that I'm almost uh, testing my model with the sequence that I have tra trained on, which you don't want to be doing. I want to make another ar argument here. Um, so in machine learning, we use data augmentation to increase the number of training data. So we show different variations of data to the model in different epochs. So if you're working on computer vision, uh, you might flip your image, you might rotate your image. Uh, here, let's say training a drug classifier, you do this for a certain image of a drug you have. And you don't want to be testing your model with a flipped drug image if the original drug image has been, the model has been trained on. So data augmentation is used to increase the number of training data. It's not something you, you, you would use to test your model. And homologous uh, sequences can be thought of as augmented data. So this has been uh, an opinion base that uh, came out in 2020 from Alan Moses lab, where he the, the lab proposed that we could use uh, phylogenetic augmentation as a as sequence pairs for doing contrastive learning. So you'd embed two orthologs um, using a neural network and force them to learn a similar latent space representation. And later, um, there was uh, a work from Peter Kuh's lab, Evo Og, which showed that when you are training sequence recognition models, this evolution inspired uh, augmentation methods can be used as data augmentation. So you would, so if you have a limited set of uh, sequences, you could take the sequence, you can augment it with uh, mutation and deletion insertions, and you could apply it to the for the augmented sequences, you actually uh, transfer the same level, and just as you do with any augmentation method, and you can train the model. Now, if you compare, and you do a third stage of uh, fine tuning with the original data because uh, some actually uh, augment uh, some of these uh, mutation, deletion, and insertion operations can actually change the uh, expression profile of the sequence. However, this approach uh, seems to be, have improved model performance. And um, a recent work from Alan Moses lab showed that okay, if you do use uh, uh, orthologs uh, as augmentation method, uh, they can actually improve model performance and they used a similar strategy as Evoog. So ju just to uh, give a, a perception that okay, how two homologs uh, can be thought of as an augmentation of the same uh, uh, source sequence and how they may not be a uh, good, uh, it may not be a good idea to train, test the model with one sequence if you're trained with the other. And I think we already know this. Um, so this has been discussed uh, in some papers, including um, I think the Bessinger paper from David R. Kelly, uh, where um, uh, he discussed that uh, if you are trained, so in that paper, uh, human and mouse genome was used to train uh, the model. So the author discussed that, okay, if uh, while creating the test bit, you have to make sure that, okay, if you're trained with the orthologue pair of a sequence, you should not use that as a test sequence. 
Now, uh, if you pair that up with the previous example that I showed, that again, okay, in our genome, we have uh, homologous pairs that ex exist across chromosomes. So you see the problem that how the, this problem can permit if we create chromosomal splitting uh, to create chain intercepts. Now, for the rest of the uh, talk, I will mostly use a data set uh, and lengthy embedded data uh, from Agarwal et al. Uh, that came out in 2023. And so this paper had annotated almost 226,000 200 piece per long uh, promoters and predictive enhancers taken from K562 cell line. And the way these sequences were taken was by looking at their accessibility profile. So they're open mostly. And so they're thought to have a regulatory function. And I would like to uh, introduce a metric. Uh, Smith order alignment score, which is kind of the gold standard for calculating uh, homology between two sequences. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm just I just have a graphics for how the calculation is performed. So you can get an idea that as you have longer sequences, actually this calculation uh, will increase its square of sequence length. And I also have examples of these promoters and fugitive enhancers taken from different chromosomes. And I am showing their alignment score. So these are sequence pairs from different chromosomes. And as you can see, there are many, uh, some pairs that share uh, a very high smith Roman score. So while calculating this similar score at a match score of plus one, this match score penalty penalizing them at minus one, and for every gap opening, I penalized with minus two. So the score can range from zero to two hundred for and uh, for for these two hundred base sequences. It's interesting to see even at the range of eighty-five uh, uh, smith Roman score range, the sequence pair seems to have shared an ancestry that look very much similar to each other in terms of having the same ancestry. Now, another metric that I mostly use, uh, I'll use in the talk is maximum smith Raman alignment score. So it's just that for two sets of sequences, um, if you want to have the get an idea of what is the maximum source of degree of leakage for each sequence, so here for one sequence, I would uh, calculate the smith Roman alignment score with every other sequence in the other set, and I take the maximum score and I use this as an indication of the maximum leakage that one set has. This sequence has with sequences from the other set. Now, so far, I've only shown, I think, hand-picked examples of homologous sequences from different chromosomes. Just to show this at scale, here you can see, um, here what I did was I divided the genome chromosomally, and I took the same promoter and analyzer sequences, 200 base pair long, and I calculated the maximum smith element score across these chromosomal splits. And as you can see here, the genomic sequences align with each other to a much higher degree compared to a null model, where, which, which is the diagonal shuffle sequences of the same sequence sets. And so you do, if the sequences were unrelated, you don't expect them to have uh, such high alignment score to each other. And again, this, is, this calculation was done for these promoters and period enhancers if you do this for genomic sequences, this would become even worse. So I, I just want to mention this here that uh, if this analysis is transferred for genomic assays and genomic sequences, or even if we do it for longer sequences, the problem would start to increase rather than decreasing. So 
what this uh, data said, uh, we were able to calculate the all by all sequence alignment scores. And what I'm showing here that, okay, I divided as, just so we could use it for all the analysis. However, so here I had created uh, two sets of sequences taken from one half of the chromosome and other set taken from the other half of the, chromosome, other half of the chromosomes. And then I had this uh, uh, smith uh score calculator. Then I did a hierarchical clustering for this. And as you can see here, there are groups of sequences that cluster together. And also like this is not like a one cluster thing, but actually there are many clusters that appear. So because there were clusters of sequences, this uh, um, led us to believe that, okay, it's not like it's only like, you know, two pair of sequences that is only acting as homologous pairs, but they're matching with many other sequences. So they could, it could have to do with repeat elements. As I mentioned before, 50% of our genome you know, uh, are uh, consist of, consist of repeat elements, I think based on the annotations by the repeat masker project. So even in our sequence library of uh, promoters and enhancers, half of them um, overlap with annotated repeats, and almost half of them uh, are does not overlap with uh, repeat regions. Now we saw that most of those, like if you think of the graph that I showed before about, I think just the, now. Most of the higher homology range sequences, they actually come from repeat regions. So here I'm showing uh, the CDF, uh, the CDF graph for genomic and dendritic shape of sequences. As you can see here, for dendritic shape of sequences, there are no sequences that have maximum alignment score of greater than seventy-five across two sets. But for genomic sequences, you have um, some sequences that have like higher alignment score than this uh, range of like you know, that you expect for unrated sequences. But for repeat regions, a larger proportion of sequences have like higher similarity to each other. And if you take the non repeats, uh, you still have some, but they're substantially lower. So many of these sequences, uh, sequence pairs that have high homology to other sequences of interest, they come from, they mostly come from the repeat regions. <clears throat> uh, and I just want to mention something here that uh, it's not like that we can uh, ignore this repeat region because this is a data set of promoters and putative enhancers. So they are of interest to us. And we'd have to use them for any kind of genomic analysis. And they have, uh, I think, regulatory activity that we see, a uh, wide range of regulatory activity uh, in terms of acting as a regulatory element. Or if you, even if you look at uh, genomic assays like uh, chromatin weeds, you see that this repeat regions have like or the sequences of high homolog the sequences that have like um, corresponding high homologous sequences at other chromosomes, they show a varying level of epigenetic profiles. Now, I, now that we, I think uh, we have discussed the problem uh, we have, uh, now what would be the impact of this problem when we are training models on such data? So to show the, uh, extent, uh, we may have this problem when we try to train uh, predictive models on our probed data points from the sequence space. We train, uh, we pass like uh, did a heuristic, we, and we call it the Oberfit's nearest neighbor, uh, short Oberfit NM, just a part of the neural networks. So it is a near neighbor model. And so when it is given any sequence to predict on, uh, it looks for the most similar sequences in the training set uh, based on Smith-Raman Smith alignment score. And 
it averages their prediction, uh, their expression profiles and makes a prediction. And uh, later what we did is that uh, we applied over fit and n uh, on a chromosome splitting of uh, these promoters and enhancers. And we compared how our fit and n performs uh, when we compared against neural networks that are uh, widely used uh, to predict expression profiles. Now, if I look at the um, lower homology range where two sequence almost have no sequence identity information, something like over completely uh, fails. And that is expected because over doesn't have any idea about cystic grid logic. It's just looking at the most similar sequences and using those to predict expression. And if we look at some of the neural networks that uh, uh, that we use to break expression, they perform uh, to some extent. And also, I think this is a uh, proof that, okay, yeah, the neural networks are learning uh, the underlying cystic grid landscape. Otherwise, uh, how could they predict uh, expression at the unrated range? Or they're learning something that uh, relates to gene expression bridge function. Sorry, uh, oh. can yeah. you guide me through this plot? I don't understand why uh, overfit and oh. n is as good as dream RNN. I, I don't. Oh no, sorry. So, so here in this plot on the x-axis, you can see the uh, smith Smithermann local maximum smith Smithermann local element score mm -hmm. range between the training and test set. So I have created a chromosomal splitting. Okay. This of is the genome. on the x-axis. Yeah. Sorry, I think I should have actually uh, start, uh, started by explaining the x and y axis. So I have split the genome chromosomally. And on the so on the training set, I have some chromosomes. On the test set, I have some sequences from the other chromosomes. And I've trained like, you know, gmRNN, NPRNN, which are neural networks. And I have also applied over PTNN on that data. And on the uncorrected range, over PTNN doesn't perform. And, it, and you expect that to happen because at the 60 to 50 alignment score range, like there is no homology. So how can it find the most similar sequence? Even if it finds the most similar sequence, that doesn't mean anything, right? I think Lee Zamparo had, has a question. Yeah, so just a clarifying question. The Smith-Waterman local alignment score you're showing here, that's the maximum? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this yeah, the yeah. maximum yeah. local homology yeah, is from the, every point in the test set to the training set? Yeah, so this is so for any test sequence, it is the maximum smith and element score. Okay, I thought I thought so. I just wanted to make sure I follow you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for asking that. So now if I uh, move uh, along the ledger of like this maximum smith and local alignment score, so what I've done here, I've just taken the test data and I've stratified it based on the maximum alignment score. It, those sequences have to the training data. As you move along the ledger of uh, the maximum smithermann element score, you see that the network performance and the overfit and end performance both are increasing. And the way overfit and end performs at the higher homology range, I think, I think that's impressive. And we also expect that to happen to some extent because those are, uh, homologous sequences, they're the same ancestry, and they will share uh, the function to some extent. And this is the reason, uh, the reason because they actually share reactivity, the same reactivity, that's the reason that, okay, homology-inspired augmentations work in genomic sequences. So if two sequences, if, if a sequence's expression can be just predicted based on the sequence similarity, you don't want that to have in your test data because it's not helping you to understand how well your model has generalized. So we're showing this to show that, to prove this point that anything that can be predicted by our PTNN, you don't want them to uh, occur in your test set. And another interesting thing that we see for uh, the neural network switching here is that network performance 
decreases to some extent along with homolo uh, uh, more distance sequence homology ranges, but there is also an uncanny valley. So, and this thing actually pops up for different chromosome splits and for different types of neural drug architectures. So this uncanny valley could be related with, uh, could it could be that uh, there is a competition happening between generalization and memorization in the network uh, that is yet to be established. Now, um, we also wanted to see that how uh, during the training of network, how a network is behaving on these like uh, different subset of the test data. So we sub we have subsetted the test data based on the maximum alignment score test to the training set. We see an interesting thing that during the lifetime of training, if we evaluate the model on the unseen test set sequences or apparently unseen uh, test set sequences, at the higher, sorry, at the highest homology range, the network feeds very faster. Even the network is feeding faster to them than the overall training data at a faster rate. And feeding faster to sequences like that matches with the, the notion of overfitting. So another reason that okay, you may not want to have those sequences while uh, during your model evaluation. Okay. Now, um, I want to discuss another point that in terms of when we use these sequence-based models, what could be the effect of on downstream tasks that we are applying them to? So I want to introduce this term, uh, genome doppelgangers, coined by my supervisor, Carl DeVore. And yeah, so Carl is very passionate about uh, naming things. So yeah, we have uh, homologous sequences that appear across chromosomes. So one sequence can appear in multiple places uh, in the genome. And we are interested about genomic variants that we can correlate with uh, phenotypic changes and we mostly derive them from genome-wide association, association studies. Now, if you think of some of these genomic variants, what if they're part of a, this, a part of the, this homologous pairs, where the variant is actually centered on the homologous sequence, then what might happen is that one, the alternate allele of a GOS variant uh, would occur somewhere else in the genome with the flanking region. So when we are applying these models to do variant effect prediction, now the, when we apply these models, we say that the alternate allele has never been seen by the model. And that's why it is allowed to make the prediction and evaluate the model, even for less than the training set sequences. But those sequences may have been seen by the model many times somewhere else in the genome, where the alternate allele was uh, in the center of the plank. Now, this wouldn't be uh, like if this was to be a problem, like uh, how big of a problem would it be, or how many? So uh, we took the open target uh, GWAS data set, we filtered by uh, PIP score and took only those names that had greater than 0.1 PIP score. So we know that uh, these are kind of like just to do some sort of fine mapping. And we saw that um, if you think of the 20 BP flanking region around the alternate allele, then 16% of the sequence actually appears somewhere else in the genome. Uh, so that was kind of, uh, very much surprising. If you take 40 BP region surrounding the alternate allele, almost 6% appear um, somewhere else in the genome. So a high percentage of these just names have doppelgangers, alternate allele doppelgangers. And these alternate allele doppelgangers appear many times in the genome. It's not just that they're appearing only one time. So in the x-axis, you have the number of times these uh, 
uh, at 41 BP region, centering the alternate allele appearing in the G chromosome. So yeah, for most of them, it only appears once. But for some of them, they appear almost like 100 times, 1,000 times. So that's surprising. And just to show that, okay, it's not a problem with like, you know, like two chromosomes that are all, it's only that, okay, this kind of uh, duplication events are occurring only the chromosomal pairs, but it's actually, it happens throughout the genome. Here I have the doppelganger source chromosome location and the doppelganger location on the y-axis. Uh, this is a stacked bar chart. So y-axis is the count of doppelgangers and I've grouped them by chromosomes. And as you can see by this plot that, okay, yeah, this is a genome-wide problem. Now, I think I have mentioned that, okay, this is a problem that, that can happen because we have the alternate alleles uh, happening throughout chromosome, but you may still think that, okay, but what is, we and we have also shown that, okay, network performance can improve for homologous sequence pairs. But what would be the actual impact in terms of when we apply models to those sequences? When we don't have a, like, you know, we don't have, we have not ensured a proper training and test bit, what could be the implication? And I think that this figure would explain that uh, to some extent. So we saw that neural networks saw, show some sort of mutation or robustness to sequences based on whether it has been seen by the model during training or not, or what is it an unseen sequence? So what we did here, we took sequences and we randomly mutated them. Uh, so then we added just one mutation to those sequences and Ask the network that, okay, what has been the change of prediction? So the model predicted the pred uh, expression for the reference sequence, and the model predicted the expression for the alternate sequence. And we took the change of expression, and we saw that if a sequence doesn't have not been seen by the model during training, the model predicts changes of expression large, larger rather than uh, training sequences. So a network behaves differently. If you, if the, or given that a model has been seen, a sequence has been seen or unseen in training. So this is kind of telling us that, okay, um, some of the analysis that we do on our models, for example, something like ISM, which is this model predictor changing expression to find out the most important positions in a sequence. They might be, they would behave differently given that a sequence has been seen during training versus not. And maybe we should only, uh, Evaluate models on, even for brain deficit prediction, we should evaluate models on tested sequences just to know that, okay, how, how well my model will generalize on and let's say an actual test set, when we, maybe when we apply them to personalized genomes stuff. Now, uh, I think, uh, let's talk about a solution for this. Because I, I think we have established that, okay, yeah, we have homology in our genome. And we know that, okay, in a chromosomal splitting, we won't get rid of that homology. It would still exist. Uh, homology within a chromosome exists more, but within, across chromosomes, it can still happen. And it can impact model training. It can affect our downstream tasks, so, and which actually in turn question model reliability. So we need to solve it. Now, to, to solve this in a naive approach, you need to calculate smith alignment score for every sequence to each other. And that is a very uh, extensive calculation. Then so, it's not feasible. So we need a way to speed up this approach. And that's why uh, we developed this tool, Hashfrag, so, which uses uh, LSH Forest uh, to speed up, uh, to remove candidates that are not homologous. So you have your overall sequence data. Now you would create a, a shingling vector based on camera occurrences, and then uh, then we uh, apply a mean hashing to create a condensed uh, vector representation of every sequence. Then uh, you can apply them to, uh, through uh, many different like LSH algorithms. But we saw that LSH for us kind of give you the best recall in terms of identifying homologous pairs. 
And so after you applying LSH Forest, you are and you end up with candidates. And this is the this is the part where actually you reduce your sequence space from all by all to a uh, very much reduced subset. And then you can actually apply, uh, calculate the smith raman uh, alignment score between this reduced subset set of candidates. And later you can use them to filter out homologous sequences in the test set. You can certify the test set by ranges of homology, uh, which you have seen that, okay, it can give you an idea about how well the model is performing over different ranges of similarity. Or you can create orthogonal data spheres because if you remove data points from the test set, then actually you are not using some data points for testing or training. So you may be interested in interested in doing this at the very beginning. So you don't end up like you know losing any data. So in terms of like you know any tool like you know could be used on this, like you know, creating this like you know training and test spheres or removing sequences from test sequences. I think the biggest uh, concern would be that, okay, what is the recall of this tool? Like, are there homologous pairs that you are missing that you are supposed to identify? Now, we have been able to uh, tune our tool in a way that it actually performs uh, amazingly. Like at the higher homology range, it has almost uh, near one recall. And as I at 80 uh, smith raman alignment score, we have 95% recall. Now, another a second part of this tool is actually, is like having false positives because if you have false positives, uh, you would have to do an exhaustive calculation of smith raman on the proposed candidates. So if you have like very higher false positive, then you won't have a reduced subset of candidates so false positive is also like you know something that would be of interest in terms of practical application of this tool. And we have like managed to uh, uh, achieve uh, false positive rates of like you know one percent at our desired uh, smith raman uh, thresholds. Now uh, a bulk of the computation of the tool actually goes into uh, removing the candidate pairs and identifying the true homologs, uh, running the LSH forest on the beginning that uh, takes up almost a negligible amount of time. It, uh, for our 200,000 sequences, I think it happens you know, almost like in the range of hours. Now here, just to show that, okay, how it would scale that for 20, from 20,000 sequences to almost 200,000 sequences, the CPU time increases uh, particularly uh, with increase of sequences. Because like you, know, you are calculating an all by all uh, uh, alignment scores. And compared to hash frame, where you are calculating alignment scores for only 1% of the sequence sets. So it's making your compression visible. Now, we saw that, OK, compared to a chromosome split of sequences, which have, where you have high homology between your sets of sequences, if you create hash rate splits, you solve that problem to a great extent. So here, we wanted to achieve a smith raman alignment score of 80 as a threshold. As you can see, beyond 80, we have very few sequences. And the reason actually we have these sequences here is, uh, is due to the, the recall that we have. We don't have a perfect one recall. If we had that, then they would not be showing up in our hash frag split. Yeah. So now we have used uh, hash, uh, the, our tool to filter out test sequences uh, at different thresholds. And we saw that uh, our tool was able to filter out the highest uh, homology range sequences. And so, for example, at this range, we are almost filtering at 100% of the sequences that are leaking. And at this range, like, you know, you'd start, like, you know, missing something out based on our recall, recall curve. 
So around 80, you'd almost like, you know, only lose out five, miss out 5%. But it's nearly approximating what you would be able to do if you had the all by all alignment score calculated. So as we remove uh, test sequences based on different smith Raman alignment score thresholds, you can reduce overestimation from your network. And I think this is not only about reducing overestimation, but it would on it will if you have like you know such this created, it would make your model more reliable, because you would not have when you let's say uh, analyze any specific sequence from the test set uh, with great detail, uh, and let's say you are showing a specific sequences profile as modus prediction, uh, like in your in your paper, uh, you'd be sure that okay that okay all like you know. There's a very high chance that okay, this is not leaking with any of the training sequence. But compared to a chromosomal uh, splitting, you may be selecting a sequence where your model shows matches perfectly the profile, but maybe you just chose a sequence that had a homolog pair in the training data, and you are basically showing a training set, a training sequence prediction as the test set prediction. Okay, uh, I think. Uh, now for the discussion part, I think we have uh, established to some extent that okay, homology between training and tested sequences can comp compromise model reliability um, in terms of its application to understand specific sequences of interest or in terms of reporting performances. We have shown this for sequences that are very short. Now, if you do it for longer sequences, the model should only increase, the, perf the issue should only increase rather than decreasing. And a hash frag can be a scalable solution to create homology where chain test splits. Now, filtering false positive uh, candidate sequences is the current overhead of the calculation. And now this can be reduced by doing suboptimal. Sub uh, alignment scores on the candidates that are provided by Hashrag. And uh, Hashrag uh, can hopefully provide an accurate assessment of models' ability to understand the impact of genetic variation because you would be, you would have it end up with a test set where you don't have any leakage of the training data. And the idea is that okay, you'd be doing variant prediction on the test data. and Hopefully, you have a better understanding of how well your model generalizes for breaking impact of variation. Now, a part, while you're applying this tool, a part of uh, it is choosing a specific threshold where you want to define that, OK, oh, beyond this Smith-Raman, maximum Smith-Raman alignment score range, I consider something to be leaky. So for our specific use case of sequence modeling, uh, or training machine learning models on genomic sequences, you, I think this is where we need to be careful because if we use a very strict test threshold, we may keep some sequences on the test set where there was no way for us to learn that specific cystricotry logic. It could be like long CTC of binding sites. Maybe we, we're just like separating them out and we're sending them to test data. So the threshold needs to be lenient, just so we allow cystic logic to over on the training data as well. And leakage should be a bigger problem for longer context models and it would be harder to address. Though a, uh, I think a direct solution could be just to filter out the Ma uh, mask out leaked uh, smaller sequences on the test set. On the prep, when you calculate correlation, let's say you are predicting quantity accessibility, and the model is making a prediction. And let's say in the middle of the sequence, there are some leaky sequences that occurred with the training data. So you just mask out those range at the prediction side, and it calculate the Pearson R with the unmasked region. So you are not directly like reporting uh, the epigenetic profile or anything or any genomic track for the leaky regions. Though still like uh, leakage can occur to nearby regions based on that region if the model has memorized uh, a specific re uh, se uh, some sequence features. 
how about this could be a short term solution and another thing that okay, I'm, that I'm excited about that uh, so we just showed that okay just stratifying the test set based on smith normal alignment maximum smith normal alignment score we could uh, get a idea of like how models perform as varied into different subsets now there there is no reason that like, I could come up with a random metric and I could just like you know see varying performance levels. Um, so maybe we could develop more such uh, metrics to stratify the test set. And the best part of this is that okay you don't need to annotate more data points for this. Uh, you can just use existing data points to report your model performance in different ways. And I think this is something also. Um, uh, we are seeing more of recently. Uh, um, yeah, and I'm excited about uh, how, whether it will address this problem or not going forward, how it is addressed. Thank you. I think I will take questions.